Have you ever wondered why some people are successful in business and others are not? Here's a story about one successful business person. He started out washing dishes, and today he owns 168 restaurants. Zubair Kazi was born in Batkal, a small town in southwest India. His dream was to be an airplane pilot, and when he was 16 years old, he learned to fly a small plane. At the age of 23, and with just a little money in his pocket, Mr. Kazi moved to the United States. He hoped to get a job in the airplane industry in California. Instead, he ended up working for a company that rented cars. While Mr. Kazi was working at the car rental company, he frequently ate at a nearby KFC restaurant. To save money on food, he decided to get a job with KFC. For two months, he worked as a cook's assistant. His job was to clean the kitchen and help the cook. I didn't like it, Mr. Kazi says, but I always did the best I could. One day, Mr. Kazi's two co-workers failed to come to work. That day, Mr. Kazi did the work of all three people in the kitchen. This really impressed the owners of the restaurant. A few months later, the owners needed a manager for a new restaurant. They gave the job to Mr. Kazi. He worked hard as the manager, and soon the restaurant was making a profit. A few years later, Mr. Kazi heard about a restaurant that was losing money. The restaurant was dirty inside, and the food was terrible, greasy and undercooked. Mr. Kazi borrowed money from a bank and bought the restaurant. For the first six months, Mr. Kazi worked in the restaurant from 8 a.m. to 10 p.m., seven days a week. He and his wife cleaned up the restaurant, remodeled the front of the building, and improved the cooking. They also tried hard to please the customers. If someone had to wait more than 10 minutes for their food, Mrs. Kazi gave them a free soda. Before long, the restaurant was making a profit. A year later, Mr. Kazi sold his restaurant for a profit. With the money he earned, he bought three more restaurants that were losing money. Again, he cleaned them up, improved the food, and retrained the employees. Before long, these restaurants were making a profit too. Today, Mr. Kazi owns 168 restaurants, but he isn't planning to stop there. He's looking for more poorly managed restaurants to buy. I love it when I go to buy a restaurant and find it's a mess, Mr. Kazi says. The only way it can go is up. Introduction Habitat for Humanity International, or Habitat, is a non-profit organization that helps people in need build houses. Since 1976, volunteers for Habitat have built more than 100,000 houses worldwide. According to Habitat, however, there are still more than 1.5 billion people in the world without decent housing. In the article below, Mariko Asano talks about her experience as a Habitat volunteer. She has traveled to the Philippines three times to help build houses for people who need them. I am 24 years old, and I grew up in Nishinomiya, Japan. Several years ago, I went to Negros Island in the Philippines as a Habitat volunteer. This was the first of three trips I have taken to the Philippines as a volunteer. For me, the idea of building somebody's house abroad was very exciting. The next year, I returned to Negros Island as a Habitat volunteer. This time, I went as a student leader with 28 classmates from Kyoto University of Foreign Studies. Both the staff and the families on Negros Island became dear friends of the work team I led. Meeting these people was wonderful for each of us. Their lifestyle reminded us of the meaning and value of life. The people also helped us appreciate the more valuable things in life, such as spending time with your family, friends, and neighbors, developing close relationships, helping each other, and appreciating what you do have. These things are sometimes forgotten in an affluent country like Japan. 
We thought we came to the Philippines to help the Filipino people, but they helped us to see something valuable. They generously offered their food, space, and hearts in a way we were not accustomed to. Would you give up your bed for a stranger and sleep on the cement floor at your own house? When I took my third trip to the Philippines as a Habitat volunteer, I was assigned to a house with young people from around the world. In my group, there were Filipinos, Americans, Indians, Koreans, and Japanese. We worked together to complete a house for a family we met on the site. On the last day, all of us stood inside a room we had built in just a week, feeling a sense of fulfillment. Even now, we keep in touch across the world. Some of us are actively involved in Habitat in different countries. Habitat brings people together and helps us realize that people all over the world care about each other. Habitat sends the very important message that we can all be friends. Being involved with Habitat for Humanity has changed my life. I've learned that I can make a difference in the world. Each month, National Geographic magazine asks an editor from one of its international editions to answer the question, what are the best places to visit in your area of the world? Yong Shu Li, the editor of National Geographic Taiwan, thinks the sites below are some of the best places to visit in Taiwan. Would you like to visit these places? Shu Lin Night Market. This market is the center of Taiwanese nightlife on the north side of Taipei. It's very different from the morning markets where people shop for food to cook at home. At the Shu Lin Night Market, people show up to have a snack or drink buy a few things, and just hang around. Life really begins around 6 p.m. and can go on until 3 in the morning. On weekends, the market is open even later. Toroko Gorge The word Toroko means beautiful in the language of the Atayal people, and that's exactly what the Toroko Gorge is. Visitors can take a train or a 30-minute flight from Taipei to visit this natural wonder. A 12-mile, 19-kilometer bus tour takes passengers through the gorge, making stops for riders to walk through man-made tunnels or enjoy the scenic views. Lanyu, Orchid Island This small island about 40 miles, 60 kilometers, southeast of Taiwan is home to the native Yame people. It is one of the few places in Taiwan where the traditions of native people are still well preserved. Tourists can stay in island hotels or arrange to stay in a Yame family's home. Lanyu is also home to many species found nowhere else in the world. Its beautiful coral reefs are also great for scuba diving. The National Palace Museum When the Chinese nationalists lost the Civil War in the late 1940s, they went to Taiwan, taking the imperial treasures with them. These treasures are now housed at the National Palace Museum in Taipei. It's the best collection of Chinese artifacts in the world. So, if visitors want to know more about the cultural heritage of China, this is the place to go. However, it takes a few days to see the museum at a leisurely pace. Will people still read books a hundred years from now? A few years ago, many people would have said no. It seemed likely that computers and the Internet would replace books. Now, however, most experts think that books are here to stay. There are a number of reasons why computers won't replace books entirely. One reason is that books on paper are much cheaper than computers. Books don't need a power source either. You can read a book for as long as you want and wherever you want. You never have to worry about losing power. Also, many people feel more comfortable reading words in a book than reading words on a computer screen. It's less tiring to the eyes. Will books in the future be similar to the books you can buy today? The answer to that question is no. In the future, you may only need to buy one book. With this one book, you will be able to read novels, plays, 
and even today's newspaper. It will look like today's book, but it will be electronic. One of the people working on the book of the future is Professor Joseph Jacobson from the Massachusetts Institute of Technology in the U.S. Professor Jacobson's book will have a small button on the side. When you press the button, words will instantly appear on the page. When you want to read a different story, you can push the button again, and a new story will quickly appear. What is the technology behind Professor Jacobson's book? Two important inventions will make this new kind of book possible: electronic ink and radio paper. Electronic ink, or e-ink, is a liquid that can be printed on paper, metal, or anything else. E-ink looks and feels like printed words on paper. Unlike regular ink, however, words in e-ink are not permanent. They can be changed by pushing a button. When you push the button, all of the words on the page go away, and new words appear. The other new development is radio paper. This paper looks and feels like a page in a book. In reality, however, radio paper is made of plastic. Professor Jacobson calls his book of the future the last book. This book, he says, will be the last book you will ever need. Chung Jae Hyuk wrote this story when he was a university student in Seoul, Korea. Approximately 10.3 million people live in and around Seoul. Wednesday, 7 a.m. I get up about 7 o'clock in the morning. Since my friends and I have a group blind date with students from a women's university tonight, I take extra time to look my best. My mom calls me to eat breakfast. But I don't think I can. It's already seven thirty, and I don't want to be late for my nine o'clock class. It takes me about an hour and a half to get to my university, so I hurry out. Eight to nine a.m. I take the bus to the subway station. There are so many people in the bus that I can't breathe. There is so much traffic that the bus can only crawl along. Finally, the bus arrives at the subway station. Unfortunately, there are a lot of people on the train, and the air is stuffy. We finally arrive at Chinchon Station, and my university is now about a ten-minute walk away. I run to my philosophy class so I won't be late again. I have already missed this class four times. Nine to eleven a.m. Thank goodness I'm safe. The professor comes in just after me, but now I'm so tired from running that I can't concentrate. Then the person next to me asks what the homework is for our English class. That's right, there was English homework, but I forgot to do it. So I spend philosophy class doing my English homework. English class is next. It seems like English is one big mountain. That we all have to get over in our university days. If we want to get a decent job, we have to be really good in English. Eleven a.m. to two p.m. After two classes, it's now eleven o'clock, and I decide to go to my club room. Our club members spend their free time hanging out in that room. I chit chat with my friends for a while, and then go to one of our school cafeterias for lunch. Two to five thirty p.m. Now it's two o'clock, and I have one more class at three o'clock. My friends and I decide not to go to our three o'clock class. I shouldn't do this, but we don't want to hurry to the women's university after class. Instead, we go to play some billiards until it's time to go. Five thirty to ten thirty p.m. It's five thirty in a coffee shop in front of the university. All four of us are excited and wondering what the girls will be like. About ten minutes later, four girls come in. Then the awkward time begins. We ask some questions, and so do they. I find my dream girl sitting in the corner, but I don't have the guts to speak to her. After twenty minutes, it's time to choose our partners. We decide. 
at the count of three, to point at the partner we would like to have. If a boy and a girl are pointing at each other, they become partners. One, two, three. My dream girl is also pointing at me. I spend the evening with my partner, having a wonderful time. Right before we part, I ask for her phone number. If she gives me her number, that means she also likes me. And she does. I get home about 10.30. I'm very tired, but really happy hoping that things go well with her. Tetsuya Saruhashi grew up in Tokyo, Japan. He worked and studied for a year in Toronto, Canada. This story is based on two of Tetsuya's experiences there. How well do you speak English? Could you survive in an English speaking country? Last year, I went to live and study in Canada. Before going, I took several English conversation classes. I also listened to a lot of English conversation tapes, and I practiced speaking English with some foreign friends in my country. But could I communicate with people in Canada? During my first months in Canada, I didn't have a lot of trouble understanding people. This was a happy surprise. Unfortunately, however, Canadians couldn't always understand me. This was because of my pronunciation. My biggest pronunciation problems were with the V sound and the L sound. For example, when I said the word vote, it sounded like boat. And when I said the word late, it sounded like rate. One day, I decided to look for some volunteer work. I went to the tourist center in Toronto to ask for information about volunteering. Can I help you? The woman at the tourist center asked. Yes, I'm looking for some volunteer work, I replied. Unfortunately, I pronounced the word volunteer like volunteer. I'm sorry, she said. What are you looking for? Volunteer work. I answered, saying volunteer again. She looked at me strangely, and then she called to a man behind the counter. Can I help you? The man asked. Yes, I'm looking for some volunteer work. I repeated. Could you write that for me? He asked. I wrote the words down, and he immediately understood me. After that, I spent a lot of time practicing the V sound and the L sound. I had trouble pronouncing a few other English sounds too. I remember a funny experience I had at a nightclub. I wanted to get something to drink, so I went up to the bartender. Excuse me, tonic water, please, I said. What? the bartender asked. I asked, Can I have a tonic water? Say it again, he responded. I was kind of disappointed that he couldn't understand me. I repeated my request several times, but still he couldn't understand me. Then, suddenly, he opened the cash register and took out some quarters. He put the quarters on the bar and began to count them. At first, I didn't know what he was doing. Then, suddenly, I understood. I asked for tonic water, but he thought. I asked for twenty quarters. I burst into laughter and said, No, I didn't ask for twenty quarters. I just want tonic water. The bartender seemed embarrassed. I'm so sorry, he said to me. The music is so loud. Now, whenever I ask for tonic water, I remember this incident and I look forward to the bartender's response. Just before midnight on December 12, 1972, Eastern Airlines Flight 401 fell out of the sky. The airplane crashed in the Everglades area of Florida. Of the 176 people on board, 99 died, including the airplane's pilot, Bob Loft, and the flight engineer, Don Repo. About three months after the crash, A high ranking executive of Eastern Airlines boarded an aircraft for Miami, Florida. He spotted a man in a pilot's uniform sitting alone in the first class section and went to sit down beside him. 
the executive struck up a conversation with the captain. After a few minutes, he realized that he was talking to the pilot, Bob Loft. Then, the pilot faded away. A week later, an Eastern Airlines pilot and two of his crew went into a staff room at John F. Kennedy Airport in New York. They all saw Bob Loft in a chair. He talked to them for a while, then vanished. The men were so shocked that the airline had to cancel their flight. Three weeks later, a passenger was sitting in the first-class section of a flight to Miami. She was worried about the man in an Eastern Airlines uniform sitting next to her. His face was white and he looked ill, so she called the flight attendant. The flight attendant leaned down to speak to the man, but he ignored her. Then, as she touched his arm, he slowly faded away, leaving only an empty seat. When the plane landed in Miami, the passenger was taken to a hospital in a state of shock. Later, when she saw photographs, she identified the ghost as flight engineer Don Repo. Over the next few months, more than ten flight attendants claimed to see Don Repo. The ghost seemed to appear more often on some aircraft than on others. Rumors began to spread that he appeared only on planes with replacement parts from the crashed Flight 401. It was usual practice for an airline to use undamaged parts from a crashed plane in another plane if they passed strict safety tests. The stories must have worried the bosses of Eastern Airlines. They ordered their engineers to remove from their planes all equipment from the 401 wreck. It seemed to work. When all the parts from Flight 401 had been removed, Bob Loft and Don Repo left Eastern Airlines and their aircraft in peace. No one has seen their ghosts since. On September 30, 1999, there was an accident at a nuclear power plant in Tokaimura, Japan. On that day, three plant employees accidentally poured too much uranium into a tank, which led to a leak of radiation. At least 90 people were exposed to high radiation. One worker died. Other countries have had similar accidents. There was a close call at a nuclear plant at Three Mile Island in the United States. On March 28, 1979, there was a reactor meltdown at this plant. A reactor meltdown happens when the fuel inside a reactor melts. Unless immediate safety measures are taken, a meltdown can lead to radiation leaking into the atmosphere. Probably the most famous nuclear accident occurred at a plant in Chernobyl in the former Soviet Union. The accident happened on April 26, 1986, when things went terribly wrong during an experiment. This caused a meltdown so serious that the top of a reactor exploded into the sky. Radiation leaked into the atmosphere for more than a week. Wind carried some of the radioactive pollution over large parts of Europe. Many deaths and birth defects throughout Europe have resulted from this horrible event. The idea of using nuclear power as a form of energy grew out of weapons research before and during World War II. 1939 to 1945. Nuclear power was first used to make electricity on December 20, 1951. By the 1960s, nuclear energy was becoming cheap to produce, and utility companies were building plenty of plants. However, in the 1970s, there were concerns about the possibilities of nuclear disasters and environmental problems. Then those concerns came true, with the tragedy at Chernobyl and the near disaster at Three Mile Island. Today, supporters of nuclear energy say it is a necessary source of power. This is especially true in countries like Japan, which depends on nuclear energy for about 35% of its power. Obviously, taking away that source of energy could badly hurt the economy. Also, while minor accidents sometimes happen at nuclear plants, most are contained without deaths or serious injuries. For now, nuclear energy is probably not going away. Citizens should demand that government agencies have very strict safety measures for nuclear power plants. 
At the same time, we must find other safer and cheaper sources of energy. Vanessa May was born in Singapore in 1977. Her mother was Chinese and her father was from Thailand. At the age of four, Vanessa May moved to London, England with her mother and stepfather. As a young child, Vanessa May was already a talented musician. She took her first piano lesson when she was three years old and her first violin lesson when she was five. Developing Skills Vanessa May studied music at the Central Conservatory of China in Beijing. She was the youngest student the conservatory had ever accepted. She also took lessons at the famous Royal College of Music in London. The director of the college described Vanessa May as a true child prodigy, like Mozart and Mendelssohn. When Vanessa May was just eight years old, she had to make a big decision. She was equally gifted at both the violin and the piano, but she had to concentrate on just one instrument. Although she had just won a prize at a famous piano competition, Vanessa May chose the violin. At the age of nine, Vanessa May went to Germany to take violin classes for advanced students. The best students were usually chosen to be a part of the recitals just once or twice. Vanessa May was chosen four times. These were her first performances in front of an audience. By the time she was ten years old, Vanessa May had studied the violin at some of the best schools in the world. She made her first professional appearance in 1987 with the Philharmonic Orchestra in London. Vanessa May often played Mozart concertos. A concerto is a piece of music written for one or more solo instruments accompanied by an orchestra. Accomplishments By the time she was 12, Vanessa May had played with orchestras all over the world as a soloist. She had also released three classical recordings. Although she loved classical music, Vanessa May wanted to experiment with other kinds of music. At 14, she began to combine the traditional sound of her acoustic violin with the sounds made from her new electric violin. She called this music techno-acoustic fusion. Vanessa May loved the music that the two types of violins made together. Her first album with techno-acoustic fusion music was called The Violin Player. It was an instant success and sold in over 20 countries. It was even a hit on the best-selling music charts. No longer just a classical musician, Vanessa May was asked to perform at international rock concerts. At a concert in Switzerland, the audience of 50,000 people gave her a 20-minute ovation. The crowd did not want her to stop playing. Vanessa May has sometimes been criticized for not just playing classical music. However, she feels it is important to introduce violin music to a new audience. If, as a result of my music, people see the violin as a fresh, up-to-date instrument, that's fine with me. Popular sport in Asia, North America, South America, and even Europe. While the rules of baseball are similar from country to country, the behavior of baseball fans is very different. Here's a look at some of the differences in fan behavior around the world. In Japan Baseball fans in Japan are loud, really loud. The sound of chants, cheering, drums, and trumpets continues nonstop throughout a baseball game in Japan. When a team goes to bat, their fans sing a different song for each batter at the plate. And even when their team is losing badly, Japanese fans continue to yell and scream. Foreign baseball players in Japan are often surprised that the fans never boo a player. According to the American pitcher Brian Warren, baseball is more fun in Japan. When I used to play in Venezuela, Warren said, Fans threw things at me when I didn't pitch well. This never happens in Japan. 
When a Japanese player hits a home run, the fans give the biggest cheer of all. A bonsai cheer. That's when the fans yell with both of their arms above their heads. In Taiwan, baseball fans in Taiwan are just as loud as the fans in Japan. In Taiwan, many fans use air horns to cheer their team on. These horns are so loud they can really hurt your ears. Taiwanese fans often yell "charge" to excite the baseball players, and when a player hits a home run, there is a special tradition. After the player runs around the bases, a young girl presents him with a stuffed animal that looks like his team's mascot. In the United States, Asian visitors to the United States are often surprised and disappointed by how quiet American baseball fans are. When I went to a baseball game in San Francisco, everybody was just sitting there watching the game. It was kind of boring, says Barry Lin. A Taiwanese student at the University of California, Berkeley. Baseball was invented in the United States, Lin says, but Americans don't seem very excited about their game. It's true, baseball fans in the United States are some of the quietest in the world. It's common to see baseball fans eating hot dogs and popcorn and chatting with friends. When I go to a baseball game, says Ginger Hansen from San Francisco. I want to have fun with friends and catch up on their lives. The real reason I go is for the social experience. In the Dominican Republic, like the fans in Japan and Taiwan, the fans in the Dominican Republic cheer loudly throughout the game. They also sing and dance. Since music and dancing are an important part of Dominican culture. You might even find a merengue band moving through the stands at a baseball game. Despite the music and dancing, many Dominican fans are very serious about baseball. Carol Parmenter, an American living in the Dominican Republic, says, "At Dominican games, you see groups of men drinking small cups of sweet coffee, carefully analyzing every pitch, every hit, every play." American fans don't usually follow the game that closely. Mika Tanaka, a college student from Japan, had a wonderful homestay in London. She lived with a British family and studied English for a month. What do you want for your nineteenth birthday? My parents asked me. A ring, I replied. However, instead of a ring, my parents gave me a one-month homestay in London. On February eleventh, I left Japan. On the plane, I worried about being all alone there, a stranger to London. But when I met the Flannery family, my host family, their warm welcome made me feel at ease. Both my host father and mother were very kind and treated me like their own daughter. Getting ready to go. Before going to London, I did some research on English schools in London. And chose Oxford House College, mainly because it had reasonable fees. Also, there weren't many Japanese students at Oxford House. I took my parents' advice, and requested that my homestay family have both a mother and a father, be native-born, non-smoking, middle-class British people, and live near a subway station. I later found that this was very good advice. Since some of my friends at the English school were having problems with their host families, living in London, potatoes. It took me a little time to get used to the many kinds of potato dishes served: fried potatoes, steamed potatoes, sliced potatoes, and different colored potatoes. My host mother was a good cook. She made delicious pasta and chicken dishes, and even cooked rice for me. Nadege, a French girl, was another homestay student living with us, and we went around London together. On Saturdays, my host family would have a party at home with friends or family. When we returned from touring London, 
Nadege and I would join the party. On Saturday evenings, Mr. and Mrs. Flannery would go to their favorite pub to spend time together. Although I selected a school with few Japanese students, there were still at least two in each class. In class, I tried to speak a lot, but many Japanese students didn't use their English very much, even if they had large vocabularies. And spoke only Japanese with their friends. Sometimes I asked other people their impressions of Japan. Japanese people work too hard, said my French friend. My teacher thought that Japanese people were very rich. I did not agree with these points, but I was interested in knowing what foreign people thought. One month in London made me realize that speaking English was very important. Because it is the language that people from many countries use the most. I would like to be more open minded about people from different countries, like my host family is. 1. Do you think neighbors are important? I think neighbors are very important because they are some of the people that you are around every day. If you ever have a problem, you may need to ask a neighbor for help since they are right nearby. If you are new in a place, you can always ask a neighbor where to find something, and they are also right there if you are in danger, and knowing they are there might make you stronger or less afraid. 2. What are the qualities of a good neighbor? I think the most important quality of a good neighbor is friendliness. For example, saying hello when you see each other is a good quality. I often speak to my neighbors and try to be friendly because one day I might be lonely and sad. And if I have been friendly to my neighbors, they will be friendly to me and cheer me up. I also like for my neighbors to be patient and honest. If I make noise and disturb them, I would like them not to get angry, but to just tell me that the noise is bothering them. I also think neighbors should be polite and not disturb each other unnecessarily. 3. Now that most people watch a lot of TV, how do you think this has affected relationships with neighbors? I think TV watching has had a very bad effect on relationships between neighbors. In the old days, people would go out for a walk in the evening or sit outside their houses. They would make friends and keep up with what was happening in their neighborhood. But now, many people just plop down in front of the TV in the evening and are couch potatoes. Having this kind of habit keeps people from being able to build close relationships with their neighbors and even members of their own family. 4. Do you think it's important to teach children how to have good relations with neighbors? I think it is important for children to be polite to neighbors. If your children offend your neighbors, then it is hard for you to have a good relationship with your neighbors because they will be upset by what your children have done. One thing that is important for children to learn in life is how to relate to others. It is actually a good opportunity for them to learn this in their interactions with the people they live close to. 5. How has the relationship between neighbors changed over the last 20 years? I think that 20 years ago, people cared more about each other. I think that neighbors saw themselves as a kind of group to help each other. But now, with so much violence and dishonesty in the world today, I think many people are afraid to get involved with others. They don't know if they might be taken advantage of or get in trouble in some way. However, I think that inside, people want to find friends and they want to love. As Mother Teresa said, everyone, no matter what color or creed, wants to love and be loved. I believe that even though we may not be perfect, I think we all would like to live harmoniously with our neighbors and others around us. Community 6. What are some of the qualities of a good community? I think the most important quality of a good community is to be unified. That doesn't mean that every single person has to think exactly the same thing, because that is not possible. But I think they should all have the same ideals. In other words, to be compassionate and concerned about each other, to want to be honest and trustworthy. 
I know this sounds idealistic, but if you only want to better yourself and live to make yourself rich or more comfortable, you soon find that nothing makes you happy anymore. But if you can incorporate giving into your lifestyle, then you do not lose the joy of living. 7. In China, are there many facilities for improving relations between neighbors? Well, there are some, but not very many. In the old days, the people in China simply had time, and this helped to facilitate relations between neighbors. Spending time really means the most in almost any relationship. If you spend time to talk or listen, that goes far to build good neighborly relations. Of course, having a place to go to mix and mingle with people your own age also helps. You can see these facilities springing up here in China. How do people in China feel about protecting historic buildings? I think people are beginning to understand the principle that old buildings are sometimes, I don't say always, treasures to be preserved. Today, most people agree that if a building is an important part of history, then it should be well taken care of. But I think what's missing is the protection of the building's atmosphere. It's not enough to just keep the bricks and mortar from falling apart. You also have to be careful you don't ruin its appeal to visitors by having it overly touristy. The Forbidden City here in Beijing is a good example. It's an amazing place, but it's really boring now, because it has no atmosphere. It's so crowded with sellers, tourists, tour guides and shop vendors that you feel like you are just in a shopping street, not an ancient seat of imperial power. 2. Is it important to preserve old buildings? Well, sometimes. Some old buildings are good to keep as reminders of the past, as long as they remind people what was right or wrong, not just that they existed. Some old buildings are just wasted space. If the building is a symbol of something good or important to remember about the past, then it should be kept. If it's ugly or in a place where something more useful to the people could be built, and it is not very unique or special, then I would say it's better to get rid of it. 3. Do you think an area can benefit from having an interesting historic attraction? For sure. Most historically important places are tourist attractions. That can be good as tourism benefits the local economy. Also, attractions can give locals something to be proud of and a reason to live and work there. If the historic building or natural wonder is not a major focus or is too neglected and out of touch with the present, then such historic places lend a kind of dignity to an area. They show the past and present are well integrated, which suggests a vision and plan for the future. 4. What do you think will happen to historic buildings in the future? I think there will be less of them, but the ones that remain will be well preserved. I think a lot of old buildings will become like little islands of the past in an ocean of a modern world. At least that's what I think will happen here in Beijing. I really don't know how historic buildings in other places around China will hold up. Probably a lot of them will lose their uniqueness and beauty to over-tourism. Others will simply fall apart and no one will even remember what they were or what importance they held. That's what time does. Housing 5. Compare old houses and modern houses. Which do people prefer to live in? That's easy. Nearly everyone wants to live in a new house. Whatever appeal old houses have to the artistic or nostalgic mind, that appeal is not as strong as running water, electricity, central heating and a well-functioning management. It's mostly the older generation, or my parents' generation, that prefers old houses to new. Among my own generation, if we can, Nearly all of us will choose to live in a modern apartment. 6. How has housing in China changed compared to your parents' time? Housing today means tall apartment buildings if you live in a city. In the countryside, I think it's mostly unchanged. Only the objects inside of the houses are different, but the conveniences widely available in modern urban housing are many. Better electricity plumbing systems and heating. 
Many of these were rare before. 7. What changes do you think will occur in the future? If the current trend continues, residential contractors will keep building the same style of buildings until some creativity enters the business. Modern housing in China is all the same. Tall, identical apartment buildings around a central garden or courtyard, sometimes with a smaller building adjacent or built into the foundation of a few of the taller buildings. It will probably be many years before this trend is reversed. That's too bad, because a lot of what is being built today is wasting space and materials. But I'm hopeful that it will change, even if it takes a while. 8. What factors do people consider when deciding where to live? Scenery, convenient transport, availability of stores and restaurants, noise or pollution levels nearby, the list goes on and on. Then, of course, there are the actual attributes of the apartment complex they choose, whether it has hot water and central heating, and what ventilation system is used. But in the end, the cost of living is the biggest factor. If one's income is high enough, then he can afford to be choosy about the other factors. 9. How do you think the climate of a place affects the way buildings are constructed? The design? I don't think climate affects it that much. The outer design of a building can be pretty much the same, whether it's in a temperate, cold or hot climate. It's more the structure that matters. Buildings that are further north are generally built with more insulation and double-pane glass. Although, if the architect is really good, he will design a building that is in harmony with its surrounding nature and one which makes use of materials and the sun's light to keep the building naturally temperate. This is also good for the environment as it uses less energy to keep it cool or warm. Do you think children should have their own rooms? I think that it is good for children to have a chance to share rooms with other siblings. Once they get a little older, many children like to have their own rooms and learn how to take care of them. I think it's good for them to have a chance to have both their own room and a shared room. They learn many good things from each situation. 2. How do children benefit from sharing a room with others? They learn how to get along with the people they share a room with, and they learn to share their toys, which is very important later in life. They learn to share responsibility in keeping the room clean and neat. They have someone to play with and don't have to be lonely. Someone who can be a close friend. I think that it is more beneficial for children to share a room than to be by themselves. 3. Do you think people have enough privacy today? Privacy is often very important. To those people who like privacy, it seems they can never have enough and they will always want more. Others would rather exchange privacy for more protection. They don't mind having less privacy if they know that in exchange, they don't have to worry about theft or being in danger. 4. What do you think of people who decorate their houses in a very flamboyant manner? I think that they want to make a statement of their status when they decorate in a colourful and showy way. This may not always be so, as some people may just like the decor. Often the decoration is to show their artistic tastes, because it is difficult to make a colourful decor match well, having a well-arranged and well-decorated house shows a lot of taste on the part of the owner. 5. Have the rooms in houses changed much compared to the rooms of your parents' youth? The layout of houses and rooms are pretty standard and stay almost the same. One thing that does change is the material that the furniture is made out of. When my parents were young, Almost everything was made out of wood, and sometimes metal. There was rarely anything plastic. Today, much of our furniture is made out of plastic, metal, and other man-made materials. 6. How do you think the climate of a place affects the way buildings are constructed? The design. Well, in my view, climate has quite a lot to do with the way we design and build our houses. For instance, in places where it snows a lot, you find houses built with a steep roof, 
so that the snow can't settle on and damage it. But in warm climates, the houses are often built with a veranda to keep the sun out of the rooms and to provide a cool place to sit. 7. How do you think rooms will change in the future? I think that in the future, rooms will change to use more natural materials. There is a great demand for genuine wooden furniture, and it is very stylish to use furniture that looks like the furniture used in the past. I think it's a good change. Other than that, I can't see that much of a change in rooms, really. Places for public use. 8. What kinds of public places does your hometown have? In the place where I grew up, there were quite a few small parks and places to stroll around. There were not many playgrounds for children to play in, but my siblings and I liked to run and play games. We were very happy to play in the open area in front of our apartment. There was also a nearby field where we could play football and a track to run around. 9. Do you think it's important to have facilities such as public parks and playgrounds? I think that it is important to have places that are safe and clean for children to play in. It's good to have large open areas where both children and grown-ups can get good exercise outdoors in a safe environment. If nothing but skyscrapers are being built, then of course children are going to suffer. It is more important to have parks and playgrounds than some of the other facilities that are being built nowadays. 10. Compare public facilities, such as parks, in China today to those of the past. In the old days, there were not many parks or public facilities, and the ones that were around were often small and unkempt. The plants were not taken care of and the ground was often dirty and littered. Today, more efforts are put into keeping the parks clean and the area free from litter. The plants are well taken care of and emphasis is put on making the parks look pretty. 11. In your opinion, how will public facilities change in the future? I think that there will be larger and nicer parks made in the future. I think the parks will be made available to more people and easier to reach. I also think that there will be more playgrounds and better equipment. You know, in the future there might even be transportation to and from the playgrounds that would include free refreshments. Is tourism an important industry in China? In my opinion, tourism is very big in China. I believe that it is very important to the Chinese economy. If it weren't for tourism, China would have to look for other ways to bring money into the country. Tourism not only helps to bring in money, but also helps to influence and modernize China. 2. How has tourism contributed to the development of your hometown, or the place where you live now, or China? Tourism has helped by making people more aware of the value of old buildings and famous places. Because of the attraction of these places, there is more of an effort to preserve and improve them. There is also more development to make tourists and travellers more comfortable. The hotels and hostels are improving their standards, and the restaurants are learning to cater to Westerners. 3. Has tourism had any bad effects on your hometown, or the place where you live now? Because of the rapid development and the expansion of cities, tourism will force many people to move out of their old, lower-priced homes, these people will have to find new, often more expensive apartments and houses. This may be difficult for them, and they may not be able to afford the new housing. Also, the construction workers who build new buildings and roads will be out of work when they are completed. This will cause a rise in unemployment. Accommodation when travelling 4. When people are travelling away from home, what choices do they have for places to stay? What kinds of hotels does China have? There are many very nice hotels all around China. Almost every city will have at least one of the more well-known international hotels. There are also local hotels that are cheaper and economical. Then there are hostels and dorms where you can stay for a very low price for a longer time. 5. 
How have hotels changed, improved in recent years, or compared to the past? I think the standard of hotels has risen in general. The standard hotel has nicer facilities and often more options as far as rooms and prices go. They are now put in more convenient places and also well distributed around the city. Hotel service has also gotten much better. As employees are aware of how important it is to treat guests well. Six. What facilities should a good hotel have? I think a good hotel should have everything that people need to stay for a while. It should have a restaurant or some place where the people staying there could get food easily. It should have a few places for recreation and exercise, such as a gym, swimming pool, and sports equipment room. It should also have a business center with internet access, international phone service, fax, printer, photocopier, and computer. Seven. What could be done to improve the environment, e.g., the appearance in some hotels? The hotels should be nicely and tastefully decorated. They should have a simple, efficient layout that does not confuse the guests. The outside should be clean. And the outside appearance should match the inside decor. It also would be an improvement to make sure that there are plenty of plants and trees. Eight. What kind of people, what kind of personal qualities are best suited to work in a hotel? The most important qualities for working in a hotel are friendliness and consideration. When the staff of a hotel is friendly and considerate. The guests are well taken care of and happy. It is also important for the staff to be neat and clean. This will help them to make their work area and the hotel clean for the guests. Nine. What can hotel service people, hotel employees, do to help tourists? The most important thing is for the hotel employees to be able to understand the tourists and guests. Efforts should be made to make sure that most of the hotel personnel have at least a basic knowledge of English. It is also nice to have a few people who speak other common languages or languages that are spoken by people who frequent the hotel. It is good to also be able to give directions to nearby tourist spots or have a service to help tourists get to more distant ones. One, how do Chinese people like to relax? I think that one of the most common ways that Chinese people like to relax is to go out to a restaurant with their friends or family and enjoy a good meal together. Another way to relax for them is to simply go out for a walk and enjoy the evening or morning atmosphere. It's an excellent way to relieve stress. Chinese also like to read books, and the youth enjoy going to internet cafes and playing computer games. Two. Do you think most Chinese people lead a healthy lifestyle nowadays? To be honest, it seems to me that we don't lead a very healthy lifestyle. We work a lot, are under stress, and often have to travel on crowded buses or subways. Sometimes the Chinese men, in particular, drink a little too much and end up with health problems. The way that we eat is not so good, with many foods being fried with a lot of oil. Three, what do Chinese people think about daily exercise? Is it considered important? If you ever go by a health club and see all the sophisticated machinery there, one of the most outstanding things you will notice is that it is almost empty. Most Chinese people just don't use that equipment; they don't consider it very important. Now, of course, things are changing a bit, and you do see some Chinese people out jogging or working out. But it is a slow change. With the younger generation, exercise is changing, as you will see lots of young guys out on the basketball court for hours on end. Leisure and work. Four. Do you think employers should provide recreational facilities for their employees? It would be a good idea to do this. It would increase productivity because it would increase stamina and mental alertness. Exercise is good for you, and sometimes people working just get weary sitting at their desk for hours at a time. The employers don't have to provide facilities, but it would be in their best interests to do so, 
and help to lift the spirits of their employees. 5. Should employees be paid overtime for working on the weekend? Well, if they didn't get paid, there might be a mini revolution. The weekends are very special to most people, and to have to work is a sacrifice as it is, and not to get paid would add insult to injury. On the other side of the coin, if the reason that they are working is that they didn't get the work done during the week, then they should come in of their own accord to finish this work, and the company shouldn't have to pay for this. 6. How do you think a person can find a balance between the time spent at work and the time spent on leisure? They say all work and no play makes Jack a dull boy. Well, the same holds true in reverse. All play and no work makes Jack a very poor boy. Each has to be in its own place, a time to work and a time to enjoy life. Even if you enjoy your work, you should pull yourself away from it in order to have the proper balance in your life. Sometimes you just have to stop whatever you are doing, whether work or play, and do the opposite to have a healthy life. Many people these days are literally dying of overwork, while other people are wandering around day after day with nothing to do. It is a tough thing to do, but you have to discipline yourself to work and then play. 1. What do people in China do in their retirement years? A lot of them, especially if they don't have money, don't do a whole lot, and this is a problem here in China. Some of them take care of their grandchildren, and this takes up their time. In the warmer weather, you will see them outside playing mahjong and Chinese chess. 2. How have the lives of senior citizens in China changed in recent years? Things are not as hard for the elderly people in China now. They have it easier because their children have pretty good jobs and so they're taken care of well. They can go to more places and can even drive around with their adult children, something they couldn't do in the past. 3. Would you like to live with the elderly? I would really love to live with the elderly. They have so much experience and so many stories to tell. You can really learn a lot from them. Of course, you have to be careful around them too so as not to upset them or cause problems for them. 4. What changes do you think will take place in the future regarding seniors' lives in China? If China continues to make the kind of progress that it is making, then the seniors' lives will change very much. When you are richer and have money, you can do so many more things. You will see that old people will live longer and have better lives. Of course, in the rural regions and mountainous areas, seniors' lives haven't changed that much and probably won't. 5. Who do you think should take responsibility for looking after the elderly? Should they live with their children, or is it better for them to live in nursing homes? Of course, children should assume responsibility for their parents. But if the parents' health is pretty bad and their children don't have the time to look after them, then they would have to find someone to look after them. Here in China, the parents live for their children, so it is expected that the children will live for their parents. 6. How do you think modern technology has affected senior citizens in China today? Seniors are not so much affected by modern technology other than maybe some forms of transportation. If you mean the internet or computers, I think that most seniors are not that concerned about them. Older values and going at a slower pace are more important to them than fancy gadgets. Old and young. 7. What are some of the differences in attitude towards life between young and old people in China? Young people want to see and experience all that they can. Old people are more content to just enjoy the simpler things of life, like getting together with their folks or helping with the childcare. Young people want to travel abroad and make a lot of money and buy a lot of things. Old people are just thinking about the day and what they will do that day, even if it's not so glamorous. 8. What are some of the main problems facing the elderly in China today? Well, in the city, the elderly are not facing the problems that the ones in the country are. 
Healthcare is a big issue with all of the sickness that is so prevalent in today's society. Retirement is difficult because the small pensions that the old people get here can hardly sustain them. People here in China have to retire early, so there is the feeling of worthlessness that they have to face. There are some big problems facing the elderly here in China. Nine, do the elderly in China have a lot of influence on their children's and grandchildren's lives? Oh yes, absolutely. The elderly have a lot of influence in their families' lives. You see, here in China, the family unit is very important and always has been. Our culture, as you know, goes back many years, and parents and grandparents have played an important role in this unit. Respect for fathers and mothers, grandfathers and grandmothers, is instilled in each generation. Ten, what role do the elderly play in the family? Well, old people play the role of babysitter for their grandchildren. Another role that they play is moral supporter for the family. They have to cheer for the parents when they get a good job, cheer for the child when he does good in school, and cheer for the family when they make progress together. They also have to be the family counselors to listen to and give advice to younger members of the family. Eleven. It seems that grandparents love their grandchildren more than their own sons and daughters. Why do you think that is? I don't think grandparents love the grandchildren more. They just have more time to play with them, more patience in guiding them, and they don't feel the responsibility for the total well-being of the child twenty-four-seven. Plus, seeing the children of their children brings back memories of their younger years. I think it's a great thing. Grandparents give children something special, special memories to cherish and grow up with. I think that grandparents love their grandchildren so much because of how much they also love their children.